I studied filmmaking in the US during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We we'll continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. Gordon Duff is a Marine combat veteran of the Vietnam War that has worked on veterans and POW issues for decades and consulted with governments challenged by security issues. He's a senior editor and chairman of the Board of Veterans today, especially for the online magazine New Eastern Outlook. Watch this interview. Gordon Duff is a disabled USMC Vietnam combat veteran and has worked on veterans and POW issues for decades. Gordon is an accredited diplomat who served as UN diplomat and is generally accepted as one of the top global intelligence specialists. He manages the world's largest private intelligence organization and regularly consults with governments challenged by security issues. Gordon is deputy chairman of the board of a European-based multinational company. His career has included extensive experience in international banking, along with such diverse areas as consulting on counterinsurgency, surveillance technologies, and intelligence. Duff has traveled extensively, has published around the world, and is a regular guest on TV and radio in more than several countries. He's also a trained chef, avid motorcyclist and gunsmith specializing in historical weapons and restoration. His business experience and interests are in energy and defense technology. He's a senior editor and chairman of the Board of Veterans today, especially for the online magazine New Eastern Outlook. Where do you want us to begin? I mean, I can shoot from many different angles, but where do you prefer to, to begin and then we take it on from there? I can, I can talk about just about anything. <laughs> without, without, without exaggerating, it's what I do for a living. Let me just go back for a second to the dilemma that we have right now. We're approaching September 20th in which we're going to have this conference, our conference in Beirut. And surprisingly, uh, I found that uh, for the first time before a conference begins, there's been so, many, so much intimidation by the security system in the U.S. towards potential guests. Uh, where, has this occurred before in America? No, it, it, there's never been anything like this. And, and, and I, put a, I put that down to, uh, I think you have a conference, conferences I find not always helpful anyway. Uh, in any conference, you have people there who show up essentially to gain attention for themselves, sell their books. Uh, activists seldom have political power. They're seldom players. Uh, and even past this, and this is assuming that an American president to me is middle management and organized crime. None of us have real power. The issue of a conference is to put on the record a consensus, deliver papers, a consensus of a form of reality. In this case, attempting to systematically challenge the artificial reality created by an American media that anyone that thinks it's not controlled by what 
overtly is considered the Jews, and which is a dangerous thing to, thing to say, or multi-generational organized crime, which may or may not have a Jewish or Eastern European origin, a more accurate statement, and that the media has created a sense of reality where you can fake gas attacks, uh, we can have mass murder of civilians, we can name uh, innocent nations dangerous threats based on other and absolute fiction, do it with impunity, and then smear anyone that disagrees with it. This is a very dangerous situation. When it carries through where the, uh, the institutions that could challenge it, we have law enforcement institutions, they're all destroyed in the U.S., our churches are all subservient to a, a form of heretical uh, evangelical Zionism that's certainly unimaginable as any form of Christianity. Uh, we have Congress that, based on the 2005 uh, passage of a, a, a uh, it was really within uh, a Supreme Court decision, Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, but has allowed corporate entities with no American ownership unlimited uh, access to even the smallest election, uh, a dog catcher, uh, a judge, a single member of Congress to bring foreign money in from human trafficking, narcotics. Uh, and this is where it, where it really is coming from, laundered through a corporation that can't be investigated. And that's now freedom of speech. This was an overthrow of the United States. But behind this, there's a broader history, looking at the history of Britain and the United States. We're taking this, uh, these entities back into the Middle Ages and before and seeing how we got here, that the United States was never intended to be a democracy, that Britain, when William of Orange came over with his 40,000 mercenary army to collect 15 million owed guilders to the Rothschilds, uh, that Britain's monarchy, and then after that, Britain's parliament and the two stages of Britain's central bank simply turned Britain into a mob enforcer, the kind of mob enforcer that the United States has been in the 20th century. And uh, probably the person who had that clearest was uh, Marine Commandant General Smedley Butler uh, when he called himself a gangster for Wall Street that U.S. military power invariably operates as a collection agency for world organized crime. 50, 51 years ago, I did this in South Vietnam. And since that time, it has been war after war. The issue we're finding more painful now through varying levels of expanded revisionist history is we're beginning to Look at World War II, the clean war when we were saving the Jews from the gas chambers. And um, that was never what the war was about. Uh, Americans put Hitler in power. We knew that. But when we take a broader look at history, we find that Americans financed by Rothschild-owned banks in London put Hitler in power. And we begin looking for a form of historical uh, synthesis there and are failing. Then we look at the uh, First World War and our methodologies for finding the American role as a hero saving Europe. Hardly the case. And we move back even into the American Civil War. Then when we go back to looking at the formation of the American Constitution, there are numerous areas within the Constitution that are anti-democratic. The Electoral College is anti-democratic. The Senate wasn't elected until uh, 1911. They picked senators just out of a hat, uh, like the House of Lords. The, the uh, House of Representatives had no power at all. A president could be elected no matter who voted for him. We had created a party system that was totally subservient to uh, the New York bankers. And when we trace down where this came from, we begin to see 
that when the Articles of Confederation were traded for the Constitution in 1787, that those involved in doing so, and this is Baird's economic interpretation of the Constitution, a book he wrote in 1935. But what we saw to a large extent is that the Constitution is a counter-revolutionary document to make the United States a less than democratic country so that at no time can the electorate begin seizing power from the wealthy, the powerful. And then again, we go back to the American Civil War. 500,000 Americans died, not over slavery, but over the rights of London-based banks to exploit the Southern American agricultural states as colonies. That's what the war was fought over. Half a million Americans died. And we've had decade after decade, now more than a century, to rewrite that as fiction and every ounce of American history since as fiction. Wow. wow. Listen, you have, you have this latest article, which you call Death to America, Trump's Secret Plan. What do you think of, um, and then I know there's a lot of pressure on you uh, with the whole Russia Gate thing. Um, what's going on in Washington and, and how fragile is the system right now? Well, I talk on a regular basis to Robert David Steele, a major Trump supporter who believes that Trump's joking with all of the things he's done. And, and his domestic programs are generally not seen. Destroying health care, education, environmental protections in the U.S., uh, protections for wage earners, they're disappearing. Or the fact that we're running up a trillion dollars worth of debt and 70% of America's massive debt is all based on a pump and dump that began in 2007, 2008, when the neocons got control of the United States. And behind that, we can put the shadow of a rigged election in uh, 2000 and 9-11. And, and, and I think we've all talked that one to death, and it doesn't need to be part of what it's going to exist as a backdrop. But we have $21 trillion worth of debt. We're adding another trillion dollars worth of debt. We had a major tax cut from Trump this year. But when it was done, everyone who makes under a million dollars a year is paying 12% more in taxes. Biggest tax increase in history. And behind this, we have this war between Trump, who says utterly insane things every day, and a press that follows him blindly, and another press that seems to criticize him, owned by pretty much exactly the same people who own the press that criticizes him. And as we look at CNN and the other organs of the press, we can see that the dialectic we're dealing with between those that hate Trump and that love Trump, that they're the same people, and that the victims are the American people. What is he planning to do? Uh, there are signs that if he's a loose cannon, as some believe, if he's willing to turn things around, burn the world down in the process, and if things are as so many as, uh, of us have seen them, increasingly censored, increase, increasingly tightly controlled, is it possible to take advantage of Trump's mental instability, uh, whether it's a low IQ or uh, a, a severe learning disability or a narcissistic personality disorder, as so many say, but to play to his vanity and to right some of the wrongs that went on for so long? With Iran, we thought we had corrected some of the issues during the Obama administration with the nuclear settlement. But remember, that's the same uh, administration that we believe engineered the uh, coup in Ukraine, which has had some very nasty consequences. And uh, we then have to take a look at the Obama presidency. We had a president where both houses of Congress 
were controlled by other parties, where every court, the Supreme Court and all of the federal courts, courts were under the control of the opposing party. So we had the most encumbered presidency in American history. And uh, Obama, certainly an unsuccessful president. But what do we look at as motive here? In this case, we have simple goals. We have a very strange opening at G7 where the president uh, decided he wanted to see the Russians there. And we had Zarif show up at G7. Now, Trump is not prepared for whatever reason. And the assumption is that Trump is answerable to a more powerful third party. He wasn't prepared intellectually and otherwise. And I, and I think we pretty much all understand Zarif is not just a clever guy, but he's a funny guy. And he's liked. That's a dangerous thing. When Trump's in a room with a charismatic person that's liked more than he is, he's threatened. He needed Vladimir Putin in the room. And if Vladimir Putin were in the room, something would have happened at G7. That was a missed opportunity. Since that time, we've had a chance to take a second look at this. And of course, any second look, and this is, I, there are things that, you know, the article we're talking about, for instance, Death to, Death to America, that was written for the Russian press. The original submitted article was 300 words longer than the one you're reading. Uh, the Russians, there's no free lunch there. And within that, it contains some significant classified information that for varying reasons, the Russians were not going to allow to be, allowed to be published by the Russian Academy of, uh, of Science because that was published by an organ of the Russian government. And they called me up and we negotiated the article you're reading. I wanted those things to be published. Uh, it's not for me to challenge the authority of the Russian government. Anytime any of us speak, I realize uh, when I'm speaking to you or I'm speaking to Russia or even in the U.S., <laughs> uh, I can be replaced at any given time. Vulnerability. I'm not bulletproof. And thus we go back to your issue of Beirut. Um, there has been an email and Skype trail of all of us involved in the Beirut conference for a number of months. I've watched the FBI go to one person or another. I talked to Kevin Barrett, uh, Phil Giraldi, Jim Dean. These are, we all know each other. We're all personal friends. All of us know each other and speak together all the time. You may not be aware of that. Uh, and the FBI knows me real well. I was surprised they didn't call me. I actually texted them and asked them, why aren't you calling me? You know, I mean, you, you got to know I'm on the list. I don't think they, I don't even think they're allowed to talk to me anymore for whatever reason. Um, but I don't mind engaging them. They're an institution. And what I saw of the rank and file in the FBI who are attorneys and police and people I'm not uncomfortable with that the Mueller investigation turned out to be such a sham that the loss of any institution, the FBI is certainly one, Congress, our courts, every institution in the US is collapsing. And without them, we have a presidency and the presidency is dependent on the psychological, psychological condition of someone who, when I look at him, doesn't look like he's getting enough oxygen to the brain. Uh, he's, um, you know, there are issues there. I may have personal issues with the individual. You know, we're the same age, basically. I chose to go to war, albeit a stupid war. He did not. Uh, we have different academic and political paths we've chosen. I have billions of dollars less money than he has. Uh, 
we don't share political goals. But when he asks for a meeting with President Rouhani, do we share long-term geopolitical goals? And maybe we do. Was Steele, are other people right when they're saying that Trump is pretending to be a puppet of Israel and that someday he's going to awaken and put the hammer down? And toward that end, and this is what is not seen in Iran, the influence of Israel. I've been in an open war against the ADL and APAC for years. Uh, and I fight differently than others. I have friends in every institution in the U.S. I have friends in Congress, the big law firms, lobbying firms. I'm a former Washington lobbyist. I know how to do damage. I can... I. Uh, I don't just publish articles. I believe that these organizations don't represent Jewish people in the United States who Trump has had to admit are traitorously liberal, who don't have the feelings about Iran he would like them to have, who don't share the political beliefs of the Likudists and uh, West Bank extremists in Israel. I follow Israeli politics, which are very complex. I get involved in Israeli politics, which are very complex. Uh, the Jewish community is powerful in the U.S. I've been close to some members there. And uh, they're going to play a role. But within the U.S., with the rise of white supremacism uh, and the powers of ignorance and hatred that, that Trump has unleashed, what I long ago predicted is that the primary victims of those things wouldn't be Muslims or Hispanics, but these people in the U.S. would turn on the Jews. And it's what's really happened here. And it's wrong, very wrong. And uh, it's created a situation that has driven a strong uh, uh, rift between the Israeli Likudists and American Jews, including wealthy American Jews like Les Wexner, the individual that had funded uh, Jeffrey Epstein last November. He met with uh, former President Obama and agreed to stop uh, funding right-wing pro-Israel candidates. He, uh, and he's one of the leaders of the mysterious mega group. Uh, I have friends who are close to Sheldon and Miriam L. Adelson, who are the largest political donors in the world. No one puts out money. George Soros puts out 10% of what Adelson does. And Adelson himself is a rational, likable individual although he may own the largest human trafficking organization in the world through Macau, he and his wife are not lunatics. So we have created a powerful organization, this Jewish mega lobby in the U.S. They have created a, uh, a, a certainly an organization that controls and dictates not just to the press, but to social media through Google, Facebook, Google Idea Groups, Jared Cohen and others, mysterious name I just mentioned. But they've created a situation where I think is uh, their own downfall is there. Trump came as close to paralleling the statements of Adolf Hitler as anyone possible. Trump today, in relation to America's 14 to 16 million Jews, stands exactly where Adolf Hitler did in 1934. He directly parallels it. They're traitors. The Jews in the U.S., according to Trump, are traitors. And the problem is the majority of Jews in the U.S. share my personal politics, and I find myself close to the politics of the regime in Tehran, in Damascus, and Moscow. So we've got a, we have a lot that's changed. What has changed that I think Iran doesn't see? Iran doesn't see that the Jewish lobby in the U.S. is disintegrating, falling apart in front of our eyes. And uh, 
Is that what drove uh, Trump's uh, request for a meeting? My answer would be probably. Um, my my last question, because we're running out of time, is you you are you're sensitive about many different issues, and you express very well about many many different issues. I want to ask you just about the future of the U.S. You, we see so many. Uh, media programs, uh, revolution, this, that, about the future of America and the breaking down of America. You see it in games uh, like Far Cry, uh, where Far Cry 5, America is already broken down into different states and their rivalry. There's like a civil war situation. Do you really think this is uh, a potential portrait of what's America going to end up with? If you're an American that travels, uh, I've traveled in, I'm, I'm trying to move to the 100 range uh, of countries that I've visited. I keep friends around the world. More and more Americans are realizing that we're closer to the people of Britain, Iceland, Germany, uh, certainly Austria and elsewhere than we are to other Americans. This is the most discohesive nation on earth. Uh, where I sit, I look at people whose beliefs are so foreign from my own that I have difficulty understanding they're human. And yet I spend part of the year, I have kids who live in Germany, I spend part of the year living there, I spend part of the year in France, I don't see that. I don't see what's in this country anywhere else. It frightens me. What do we talk about here in America? We talk about nothing else, nothing more than this country coming apart. We'll sit in a restaurant at a table together, look around the restaurant and think, are those Trump supporters? Are these people who hate Hispanics? Who do? who do so much of the work here, or hate people because of their color. And the idea that you could be looking at someone that hates a child because of its color, uh, it's hard for me to accept those people as human beings. It's, and the feelings that I'm having, millions of Americans, and it could be 62% currently disapprove of Trump's policies based on one of the polls. It goes as low as 56. Are there people like that, that whose beliefs are so primitive, who can never be reached, who can never live in a democratic society, who can never live or accept other people? And do we want to live in a nation with those people? And uh, my answer is, as Americans, Millions, tens of millions, more than 200 million Americans probably don't. Will that uh, end up in disintegration? Possibly, yes. Yes, it will. You know, you, because you've been a war veteran, and, and uh, as you said, in the Vietnam War, and you were, you were a volunteer, you were, you were a PFC at that time, um, that, that age cannot be compared in any way to what you're witnessing now in terms of uh, two different Americas. Is that true? Uh, that was... Leaving Vietnam and coming back to the U.S., going back to college, you know, there's a, there's a variety of experiences. Uh, the Vietnamese people were a joy. We're fighting a war there. The people were wonderful. Uh, I thought the U.S. then was, you know, People certainly didn't love Vietnam. Veterans, uh, the U.S. was racially divided at that time extremely. And we now look on that as the golden era, that the promise that was seen of that time uh, is not only gone, it's my generation that destroyed it and that we are. And I'm sitting here at 70 years old, you know, and as a Vietnam veteran, way past my sell-by date. Uh, that we've created a country where racism, hatred, and mass killing, drone assassinations, wars in nation after nation 
are accepted blindly and we just turn our back. And uh, it's my generation that did it. And if we're looking from 50 years ago, none of us could have imagined that. None of us could have imagined the Reagan presidency or certainly Bush 43 or what we have now. It was unthinkable. We actually believed things were going to get better. Uh, we were wrong. Okay, Gordon, thank you so much. I, I don't want to take more of your time. Take care. Bye-bye. Hope you have enjoyed the interview with Gordon Duff. He's among the very few who has witnessed half a century of American history and knows the reasons behind the final tremors.